Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for coming, even though this is the last class before the spring break. The plan for today is simple. I will keep my introduction short, and then we will spend most of the class watching 40 to 45 minutes from this week's film, Tulane Blacktop, which is not available on streaming platforms and can only be found on DVD or Blu-ray, but even Amazon, for example, uh, doesn't sell the correct version of the Blu-ray and only uh, the DVD can be purchased there. My copy is from the Criterion Collection. During the film or right after the sequences shown in class, you will work on some notes from this film. I have prepared a form for that. You will write your notes in pen. The form includes simple instructions, and I will repeat those instructions before we start the film, okay? This week, there are no viewing notes. There are due, no written assignments. And we will resume with the usual routine the week after the spring break. So let's talk about this film. It came out in 1971. And 1971 is a peculiar year for the road movie genre, because you find, among others, five significant contributions to the genre, each one of them very unique, very original, and although some of those five films, most, to tell you the truth, were not hugely successful in theaters that year, all of them developed a cult following of sorts. That is to say, they lasted much longer than even some of the films that were more successful that year. Those five films are Traffic, that people from the last class that I taught in the fall, CCS 325, will remember. Le Mans, which I showed, I believe, during the first week. This one, Tulane Blacktop, Jewel, directed by Steven Spielberg, although it must be said that Jewel was produced for TV, and The Vanishing Point. Now, Tulane Blacktop is unique among those because it is a film that is simple and whimsical at the same time. Keep in mind that the original cut was three and a half hours long. Probably the choice initially by the director was to make a very plain story just to show what happens in the lives of these four characters, the protagonists that don't have a name. There is one scene where the last name of the girl is mentioned, Higgins. But otherwise, the characters through the film and in the titles are simply the driver, the mechanic, the girl, and GTO, a character whose name is, in fact, the name of the car he is driving. The cars themselves, the Chevy 150 and the Pontiac GTO, are mentioned in the titles at the end, together with the actors. The film was shot very simply. They took three uh, Chevy 150 because the car uh, was that was the car most heavily used. So they knew they might need more than one. So they had three almost identical cars prepared. Only one has survived and went to auction. Into auction to auction was auctioned in 2015. The other two were reused and destroyed. One of them was used for American Graffiti, if you've seen that movie, for example. And they took the road, and they shot the movie on the road, 
they only showed the script of the next day to the actors. And they took whatever weather, whatever the weather was like on the day of the shooting, they went with it. It is the story of two friends, the driver and the mechanic, who have a strong bond, but it's kind of a silent friendship. And they bond over the choice of an alternative lifestyle because they live on the road, they move from place to place, and they participate in illegal drag races, betting money, and hoping that people who see their 55, 1955 Chevy 150, and we are in 1970, will believe that they can beat it, right? Because it's an old car, and it's dull. Doesn't look very fast either. And in fact, they've tuned the car, and they know the car so well that they always win their bets. So they're looking for someone who's gullible enough. They challenge them, and then they go for a race. They bet $200, $300. Keep in mind that at some point, they refill the car with 14.9 gallons, and they spend $5. So $300 would have been $3,000 of today that they're betting. And you know, even on Long Island, at least pre-COVID, there was a very active illegal street racing circus. I don't know what's the situation now, but up until two or three years ago, these things happened a lot, even in Suffolk County. They move from place to place. They barely scrape it, right? Because they need money for motels, for food. They, they, they of course, they eat at simple diners, but they also need money for spare parts for the car. For example, at some point, the driver complains that he barely beat a Corvette because the tires were not grabbing, because the tires are old and they're losing their grip. At some point in their life, which is the beginning of our segment of the film, another character enters in life seamlessly. They, as you will see, they're in a diner, and the girl, Lori Bird, who, like the other, had no acting experience, but did a wonderful job with this, acted in a few more films, unfortunately committed suicide a few years later while she was in a difficult relationship with Art Garfunkel from uh, the, the, the duo uh, with Paul Simon. The girl simply, while they're in the diner, opens the door to their car, enters the car, sits in the back, and they exit the diner. They enter, they get on the car themselves, and drive away. They don't ask anything. Later on, they will meet the fourth character, GTO, who's a weird fellow, because it's not like them. It's more middle class. It's more bourgeois, yet he himself is not conventional. And while the girl is clearly representative of the hippie counterculture of the time, you cannot say the same of the driver and the mechanic. They're not hippies. They live this kind of zen existence in, in a suspended condition. They're outside of society because they live on the road and inside the cocoon of the car. And that's enough for them up until a certain point in the film. Because certainly, the moment the girl enters the car and their lives, the well-oiled mechanism, the harmony in their lives is somewhat broken. And they will continue through the film to live there fluid existence. You could use the term fluid if you think of the definition and the uh, scholarship on this produced by Sigmund 
Bauman. They live their fluid life, but at the end of the film, you know that something is missing. You know that the same is not working for them. What's interesting, keep in mind, is that the movie avoids a lot of tropes that were very strong at the time. They, the movie is not about the anarchist on the road against the police, the authority. They avoid that. And that is what you find in The Vanishing Point instead. A celebration of anarchy, a film celebrating opposition to established authorities. They avoid good versus evil that you find in the duel, right? The duel, if you haven't seen it, you should. It's a short film, about an hour and 15 minutes. It's all about a mysterious truck driver pursuing a, a, a car driver, trying to push him off the road or kill him for a simple reason or no reason at all. And you never see him because the windshield is dark. So it's almost like the truck itself is trying to kill this driver. So it's not a love story because the girl is herself, you can say, fluid in terms of her relationship. So there is no chance, even though the mechanic will have sex with the girl, the driver will have a romantic moment with the girl. GTO, the other man, will have a moment where nothing is there but is dreaming of their potential future existence in another state. But the film is not about love. Again, it's a simple film. However, keep in mind that it's not simple because they went out and shot whatever came to them. It's simple and poetic. It's simple and perfect from the point of view of editing, camera angles, cinematography, etc. Photography, etc. The director, Monty Hellman, had a lot of talent. That talent didn't always come out in his movie, but even if you find YouTube videos with him talking about cinema, and you find a lot. He died only in 2021. He was not really active during the last 20, 25 years of his life. You find beautiful uh, statements about cinema, a profound understanding of what films and filmmaking are about. So it's deceivingly simple and elegantly simple in a way that made this film last much longer than the brief time that it was uh, offered in theaters. So um, once again, during the film, I want you to write a few notes on this page, have enough for everyone. However, when you pass them around, leave a couple on each row for anyone who might come in later and reach out to them and point out that they should look at this. Again, there are instructions you don't have really to explain much. At the end, leave this on my desk. And if we can please lower the shades so we can enjoy the movie much more. This is about eight minutes into the film. 